African American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and photography. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining us today on African American Legends is the legendary photographer, Chester Higgins, Jr., and we're going to talk about this wonderful new book, Elder Grace, you. which you have just published, The Nobility of Aging. Right. Now, what motivated you? Because you've done several books. We've talked about some of, some of our previous shows. Right. What motivated you to do Elder Grace? Well, two things. Uh, the culture that I come out of is a small town culture in Alabama. And small town culture and religious culture, you are taught to respect people older than yourself. Now, and small town, what small I'm, town? I'm from a little country town in Alabama, a little village of 600 people mm -hmm. uh, called New Brockton. It's in the southeast corner of Alabama where Georgia, Florida, and Alabama come together. It's, we, it's called a wiregrass area. The large town near to me is a place called Enterprise or Dothan. In this town, where everybody knows each other, everybody speaks to each other when you pass them, um, I grew up spending an awful lot of time with my father's father, my uh, grandparents' generation, and developed a real love for these, these great uncles and aunts and their friends. So the reason I even picked up a camera was to photograph my great uncle and his sister, my great aunt Suge. When I came to New York, I've always been uh, sort of uh, bothered by the fact that in urbanity, we treat older people like they're old appliances. Uh, that obviously goes against my training. I don't think that's right. And I think that we shortchange ourselves as a society by doing so. So what I wanted to do is find a way that I could communicate with society that there is a, a different way of looking at aging, a more positive way of looking at aging. Um, to look at it to show that <clears throat> aging doesn't have to be just about death and dying <clears throat> or ugliness or um, <clears throat> being invisible, uh, to show that it can be very vibrant uh, and that it can have a certain kind of grace that can be quite artful. And that's what I've tried to do here. You know, aging is, a, is, is an issue that we all should be concerned about. And if we are not concerned about, given enough time, and you will become yeah, concerned about Yeah, we're concerned about, about it every day. Right. <laughs> now, well, how long were you working on the book? And what kind of approaches did you use to select your subjects and to reach them and to research them, et cetera? It took me about four years to shoot this. Most of the people are here in New York. Um, but the, it was, what was really hard was finding the right people for this book. I've decided that I was not trying to do a book to try to, try to show that our denial of age. I wasn't looking for salt and pepper. But yet again, I wasn't looking for people who are trying to climb Mount Atlas. I'm looking for people who are settling to their aging in a mm -hmm. very comfortable way, but they had to have white hair, number one. That, that was one criteria. That was, a, that was the most mm -hmm. important criteria. They must have white hair. Secondly, they must be between 70 and 100. Third, their mind must be sharp and, and connected to their eyes. And fourth, they must have that certain kind of dignity that comes from an, what I call an interior life, not an exterior one. And it's not something, you know, you can train people to do. They either have it or they don't have it. So now, finding those people were not easy. Tell about this interior life. Now, how did you figure that out? Well, you know, I, there again, it came, I think, from, from growing up with my, uh, with my great uncle who had a, a great influence on me. Uh, one day when I was about 20 and I had uh, flunked out of my first year of college because I went into engineering. I wasn't prepared. My high school only taught algebra. And I was trying to decide what I was going to do the next year in school. And I was talking to him out in the garden one day and he said, well, being a mason, he says, whatever you decide to do, make a mark on life or else you can very well die undeclared. Well, that sort of blew the roof off my head. As a youngster with the ego of a young person to think that whatever I'm doing, no matter how important I think it is to me, that one day I can die and it never even mattered that I was here, it sort of has always haunted me and has inspired me at the same time. And that is it part of, uh, I guess that's the beginning for me of a real interior kind of conversation going on in my, inside of me that causes me to be very focused about life, very disciplined about life, and not to, uh, and to pay attention to what's going on my inside thoughts and not be distracted by exterior thoughts. 
And there are a lot of people who live like that. And I think the people who live like that, I've found, tend to age better, tend to be more at peace with themselves, and tend to be more clear about their relationship to the world, to the world around them. Now, when you approach these folks, for them to sit in your gallery or in their home or whatever, mm -hmm. <clears throat> what approach did you use to get them to say, well, look, I'm going to cooperate? <laughs> <laughs> that was a real issue because dealing with this generation of people, over 70, they don't have the ego that young people have to take my picture. So I had to reason with them, and I said to them, look, I don't like the way we, see, we view aging in this country. I think it should be changed. I'm a photographer. This is what I want to do as a photographer to try to affect that attitude. I think that a picture of you in that product would have a positive effect on people who see your picture. Would, could you, would, I, could, would you let me please make your picture? Essentially, I had to ask them to become co-conspirators with me on this particular project. And then I asked them, well, where do you feel most comfortable? Would you rather come to my studio? Would you rather I come to your home? And most of them felt that they felt most, they didn't want to be they didn't want their life to be changed mm -hmm. about traveling. So uh, they said I could come to their home. So I came to their home. I brought an assistant with me. We, made a, we set up a studio. We made a studio in their house, putting up a black backdrop and uh, using two lights. And I used a black backdrop because here again, I wanted to reinforce that white hair so that I'm really confronting you. That we're talking about people who are aging here and we're, who ha have that white hair. And we're confronting your negative assumptions about what aging can look like. Mm -hmm. So what I hope happens and does happen sometimes is that, and I think a success, is when people look at my book and they look at the exhibition and when they look at pictures and they say, well, you know, I want to look just like that when I get that age. That's what I think is important because we've managed to show new alternatives mm -hmm. to what they think aging could be about. Now, the exhibition has been at the <coughs> New York Historical Society and has a number of uh, supporters and it's gotten a lot of good uh, reviews. Um, clearly, probably by the time the exhibit is over, people will be asking for you to take it elsewhere. Do you intend to take the exhibit to other locations? Yes, the exhibition uh, so, is going to travel. It's, uh, it's been committed to go to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to Columbus, Ohio, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Newark, Delaware, uh, Dallas, Texas, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Chicago, Illinois, and uh, as, it, as it travels, hopefully other men, Do you other go with it? Only if they want me. Uh, they don't need me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, but I hope it provides an opportunity wherever it goes uh, to become um, a vehicle to first uh, let people see that aging can be seen in a more positive light. Also a vehicle for intergenerational discussion between younger people and older people about aging, about projections, about uh, expectations. Um, and if that happens, um, uh, that's what's important, and I hope it happens. Uh, we, in, this, in New York, we have tried to, we've developed school materials, teaching manual materials to reach out to all the children in the schools. And we've come up with a contest called, um, an essay contest that, that uh, involves uh, oral history skills and the end of it, the contest is called The Elder in My Life. And the children are given cash prizes for the best essay that, that, that comes out of their interviews with an elder in their life. They're, again, trying to reconnect the meaning of each other. And at the very end, we ask the students, well, uh, imagine that you in your 80s. What kind of respect do you think you deserve? Do you think that young people can conceive of themselves as being in the 80s? No, they can't. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, we have to make an effort to try to get them to see that aging is a privilege mm -hmm. and that and a process and a process and that it deserves all of our respect and our reverence. You know, one of the uh, uncomfortable things about this country, and this country is a great country, but one of the uncomfortable things we have is that because of it's a young country, uh, everything is looked at in terms of newness and progress. Mm -hmm. So therefore, older things become uh, the, the currency becomes less valuable. Uh, there's a danger in that because uh, we cut ourselves off from uh, uh, the, the older people who may have the kind of knowledge that will help our decision making uh, season better. Uh, the other problem is that in terms of social policy, as we get older and as public uh, support facilities 
are under discussion about if they should continue, if they should be enlarged. Uh, the young people now will probably be the bureaucrats then who will be making those policy decisions on our behalf. And unless they have, a, a, uh, unless they have rela meaningful relationships with elders in their life, that they understand that still because you get older does not mean that your, your life becomes less valuable, that your humanity is, 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 uh, is no longer there. Unless we have people who are sensitized to that, then we run a risk of our generation becoming toasted by that generation. So, which um, is just another reason why I'm concerned about how do we change this attitude before we go over this cliff? Let's sort of veer around. Well, and uh, selecting your subjects, you've covered a whole range of people. You've covered celebrities, you've covered actors, you've covered uh, business people. Um, artists. Artists, dancers. Tell us about some of the people uh, whom you shot. Well, you know, I, I didn't want this book to be a book about famous people. So I only shot a few of those. Um, the most famous is Ossie Davis, uh, the, the actor. Then I shot um, an artist, Elizabeth Catless, who's a sculptor. Then uh, uh, there are a couple of professors, um, like John Henry Clark or Dr. Ben. But most, uh, then there's a couple of lawyers and journalists, uh, like Evelyn Cunningham. Um, and um, I then think there's you have Deacons. Constance Baker Motley, the, yes, the, the federal judge, judge. Constance Baker Motley. Um, and then other people are just um, regular people who, um, there was a, a trolley worker, um, there was a seamstress, um, there was a dental uh, hygienist, there um, uh, a political activist. Um, there's all these kinds of um, common everyday people uh, and that's a lot about what I do in my photography, too, in all of my works. It's not the famous people that I concentrate so much on. It's I tried to find a universe, what's great in, what's the great universality that happens in very common moments. So here again, I've taken very um, everyday people, but I've shown the greatness of their aging. I've lifted them out of just uh, someone that you may not pay attention to because they don't fit a particular sort of criteria, but their humanness shines through in their, in their aging, uh, shines through in such a way that they are spectacular in their own right. Well, <clears throat> I believe all of the people you uh, photographed are African Americans. All of them in this book is African American, but I must say that I've been doing this project, the Elder Grace Project, has been a project that I have also been looking at whites and Asians as well as blacks. One of the things that I find kind of interesting is that as people age, the lines between gender and ethnicity begin to blur. Um, and I've been looking at that, and, and those who have, and it's, and it's the spirit of individual people who uh, have lived, uh, as I call that interior life, in such a way that it really has blessed them, uh, and they shine. Those faces I'm attracted to, no matter where their ethnicity is. Well, as a photographer, you have uh, an eye for people, an eye for scenes, an eye for activity, because many of your shots have been very, very creative. I recall you going to one of the uh, ceremonies for Martin Luther King, and you climbed up into the <laughs> belfry and shot down, and that picture appeared in the Times the next day. It was really a very, very beautiful picture. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when you're working with these folks, uh, do the folks you work with have some ideas of how they want to be seen? Well, um... Sometimes I do ask people, you know, that question because, see, in doing a portrait of someone, it's not really just, uh, I mean, you can do it, it's not just running in. I prefer, if I, have, if I have my druthers, I prefer to be able to sit down and talk to the person. I picked up this habit from, uh, well, uh, early days of photography, listening to Cornell Coppa, um, and they were talking about photographing writers. And they said, well, you know, let's read, a, it's best to read a book about the writer that the writer has written so that we get inside the writer's mind so when we look at the writer, we know what we're looking at. So I feel the same way about people. I want to find out as much as I can about them. In fact, while I was doing this project, we devised a questionnaire that the writer Betsy Kazam helped me with. And in this questionnaire, I was concerned about asking the kind of questions that would evoke responses that told me about their lives and their life history, but also that would give me a sense of what was their life philosophy, what they've learned from life. So for the first, in a session, most of these sessions took an hour to three hours. Most of that session was talking. 
getting an understanding of that person. So much so, yes, as a professional, I'm trained to be able to look and make quick decisions. And if I don't have a chance to talk to you, I can make a picture that still captures you because I get I, my eye is trained to pull out information from everything that you do. As I've, uh, we call it kinesics. But if I have a chance to talk to you, the more I have a chance to talk to you, at some point, I'm going to round out that, that initial image of you, and I'm going to get other things that may not have been apparent to me in the beginning. So by having this long conversation, in the course of uh, going from one to ten rows, it may be that the picture, the best picture, is probably going to be on the last row. But that doesn't mean that each picture in between was quite interesting in its own way. And that's how this particular project unfolds. Well, you uh, mainly working with still photography. Uh, what would happen if you did this project on television? Well, how would you approach that? Well, that's a different kind of thing because there, you know, in, in still photography, there's an economy of images. You're shooting for a particular moment, a particular attitude at a particular time. And in film, you're doing continuous running. Now, my answer to film and doing something like that is that I'm there again, I'm looking for, my stuff is looking for interior drama in a person. So I tend to, I would probably, I look for nuances. I look, for, I shoot tight. I look for what's coming out of the face, mm -hmm. out of the eyes. I look for what's happening to the hands. There was a very, um, there was a picture once I shot of um, a meeting between, um, uh, there was a secretary of state uh, under uh, uh, Reagan. Um, he was a general, I forget his name, but he was uh, meeting with Gromyko, and everybody in the dip diplomatic community thought it was pretty lightweight. And uh, his first meeting with Gromyko, he sat up next to Gromyko, and there's all the presses in front, and I'm making, I'm looking before I'm making my picture, and he turns over to him and he says, uh, Mr. Uh, Foreign Minister, I noticed your, in your bibliography that you, the first time you came to America was in 1952. Well, I knew that the man was nervous because he used the wrong word. Mm -hmm. He didn't say his biography. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Gromyko was, yeah. was a, very, a man of very few movements. All he did, he kept sitting straight, but he he has, his hand was folded. Mm -hmm. He just unfolded one hand, mm -hmm. and he said, well, yes, Mr. Secretary, but if you look further, you would have seen that I came to the country actually in 1946. Ooh. And at that point, uh, the secretary sort of jerked his way, and that was the picture. Uh -huh. It was on the front page. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then his office, the State Department, banned me for making pictures of him for a while. But these things happen. Because you weren't friendly to the United States point of view, I guess. Well, I, no, I was not unfriendly to the American point of view. I was clear about you know, his particular relationship mm. or non-relationship in that particular situation. Uh, it reflected or it exposed the fact that he was a little out of his water, but you know, mm. I had nothing to do with that. I just saw it yeah. and I made the picture. Now, as you uh, think about new projects, what are some of the new projects you're thinking about? Well, I want to, um, I, I just spent a couple months last year um, photographing in Ghana, uh, looking at the Royal House of the Ashantis because Yasanti Henley died, and I wanted to see, I went back to see uh, if, that, if their mourning uh, uh, rituals were anything like the ancient Egyptian rituals. And I've been reading books about this, uh, anthropological books, and I was uh, amazed to see that there was so much there in terms of symbolisms to look at and activities. It was quite impressive to see 80,000 people in procession behind the coffin of the king of the Ashantis. And I went back uh, f uh, actually four times during that year uh, for two weeks trips and intervals because things, the calendar, the morning calendar had things happening interspersed throughout the whole year and they don't end until after the first year. So I was quite impressed and I've uh, pulled together a, 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 a real body of work from that that I hope I can develop. But I don't know if that is going to be the one. I, I do a lot of, I work on several projects at a the time. They're all percolating. I'm working on a project that looks at the, uh, the ancient, um, cultures of the Nile River. Uh, and then I look at, the, then I'm looking at another what I call domestic project, uh, because Elder Grace to me is a domestic project as opposed to my international projects. And I'm looking at, at a domestic project maybe of looking, uh, revisiting um, my first book, which was on black women. So I'm always what doing... What about black children? 
Well, black children, I would start it off. You know, mm -hmm. I see things in terms of a season. So it would have to start off as a young black girl, which, you know, mm -hmm. is a reflections of the mother and father. And in actually with a, a grandmother. And as we go through seasons, as we age, um, and through uh, uh, civil foxes, the elders, to end with uh, bring that circle together with the grandmother and, uh, and granddaughter. I notice in the book it, there's not a lot of narrative. Is that intentional? I assume it was, and if so, why did you tend to approach it that way rather than talking about the person? Well, you know, um, one of my mentors taught me that if you have to explain the photograph, then, you know, it's not that good. <laughs> um, and uh, so I want to challenge, you know, I want to put a lot of information, <laughs> visual information in this picture so that when you confront this, uh, inside your mind, s stories start to unfold. Mm -hmm. Memories start to, uh, to uh, gel. Uh, and we did use a text, and the text that we use is just a quote from each person, which mm -hmm. comes out to be that life wisdom, which I like to think as proverbs. And when you take the book together with those proverbs and those, and those pictures, I like to think that we've done, uh, done more here than just create a, a positive attitude about aging. We've also delivered a book that has an awful lot of wisdom, uh, individual and collective wisdom that comes through. So as a visual person, I like to think that it's, that it's chock full of visual literacy, visual information, and that uh, life experience will fill in all the blanks and give you the, 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 the paragraphs and the chapters. You know, Romy Bearden, who was another uh, mentor of mine, said that, you know, art is never on trial, it's the viewer. And it depends on how much experience you have in your life determines how much you get out of what you're looking at and appreciating from an artistic endeavor. Well, in a sense, uh, that's the role of any artist. Right. But it also, it's the role of artists to interpret society. And you've done a number of historical events in the African-American community. Uh, which of those do you carry most in your memory, some of the things that you've shot? Well, you know, and um, there will, I guess, in, in fairness, there, if I look, think about those situations, there will come a time when I, in using those pictures, I will have to talk a lot more. <laughs> I think about, you know, the Black Power Congress uh, mm -hmm. that happened out in Gary, Indiana. I think about uh, seeing Dr. King at Tuskegee and, and the SNCC days uh, in Lowndes County. Um, my Tuskegee days, um, the days of seeing uh, African-American politicians like Percy Sutton, who ran for the first time as mayor, or David Dinkins, um, to looking at the, um, the, in, the movement of the black intellectuals as they begin to uh, take a careful look at uh, the history of uh, our African history, and to uh, question um, all of the things that have been written before and to re-examine which I think is the responsibility of African uh, intellectuals of African descent, that we must know all the things that have been written and, and projected about us. And it's our responsibility to sift through that, to, to decide what of that is really valid and what of that should be uh, challenged. Uh, and, to, and to go further and to uh, prepare ourselves to do the work that needs to be done to do the real research to bring about new interpretations and fresh interpretations that uh, sometimes uh, outsiders uh, fail to be fail to grasp. Well, when you go to a, an event <clears throat> and there's a significant person who is making a speech or is acting or whatever, do you then think of a, how can I shoot this person, or do you just shoot and then pick the best of the various pictures that you shot? Well, I try to, well, it's a combination of things because, you know, we make hundreds of decisions instantaneously when you shoot. Um, issues that have to do with subject, attitude, lighting, design, uh, composition, um, uh, point of view, all these things. Uh, I'm first, uh, I try to be non-judgmental, first of all, mm -hmm. in whatever I'm shooting, uh, because I find out that, you know, it doesn't help uh, it doesn't get in the way. I try also to disappear, not put myself in the picture, but to make that picture totally that, uh, totally that person. So therefore, I'm try my antennas is to receive as much as I can from what their personality, their spirit is, and to let them project that. And I just try to find the best way to allow that to happen. I don't, so I don't make a judgment of what it means. I just try to be very clear to capture it in its, full, in its fullness. So that as time goes by, uh, it will always be uh, the, the best representation made possible of that person. Um, 
maybe as time go by, you know, it may look as though, wow, you know, this was uh, insightful uh, based upon what may happen. But um, I'm after trying to show the individual's relationship to reality, to their reality, the understanding of themselves in that moment, and how they have chosen to uh, interact with that reality. Um, that's, that's what is unfolding in front of me, and that's what I try to show. Well, what advice would you give to aspiring young photographers who want to be the Chester Higgins Juniors of later in the 21st century? Well, I hope there's a lot of them. Well, because, number what? <laughs> and I hope that, well, you know, I, I tell people, you know, uh, I remember Nick Giovanni said to me back in the early 70s that the problem with being a star is that you become an easy target and everybody can shoot at you. Um, but that is, so you want a lot of people on the front line. You don't want to be there by yourself. But the other thing is that I can't possibly make all the great pictures that exist in our communities or throughout the world. But there are a lot of people who have access to great moments and great pictures in their own lives. And I wish they would record those moments. I believe that you always make best pictures of things that you care about, people that you love. And I encourage people to start making those pictures, to start pulling together those documents and evidence about being here, about reality. And then try to work hard to get your eye to be stronger and to be clear so that those visual documents become important to all of us. And with Elder Grace, Chester Higgins Jr. has made a major contribution. And thanks again for being with us on today's African American Legends. Thank you for having me.